we are back for the Thousand Worlds Book Club, and we're talking about A Song for Leah. I am joined by the King in the North, Rob Stark. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. A Song for Leah was written in 1973, and is arguably one of George R. Martin's best works, if not his finest work. I commonly hear from people that A Song for Leah is their favorite George R. Martin story outside of Ice and Fire. The story works on a number of levels. It's a story about relationships. It's a story about life and death. It's a story about religion. And it's a story about what humans really want on a fundamental level. At this point, we've been through enough of these stories to recognize our author's reoccurring themes. We know our author loves to write about breakups, loneliness, and feelings of inadequacy. We know our author loves to write about religion and existentialism. And we know our author loves to write about hive-minded alien races. The story marries all of these themes together to get at what the human heart yearns for. And like with Sand Kings and N7 Times Never Kill Man, we really see the foundation of the Ice and Fire universe laid out here. Even the title shows how much our author looks back to this story, whether he realizes it or not. A song. On top of A Song of Ice and Fire, our author named three book collections for songs. There's a song for Leah, Songs of Stars and Shadows, and Songs the Dead Men Sing. Not to mention the Armageddon Rag. Rag in this context means song. And then there's Leah, the short form of Liana, the woman who haunts Ned and Robert's dreams, the woman who started the war and all of the action of the Ice and Fire story. And not only does this story star Liana, the protagonist is Rob, with a double B and everything. Wait, this story stars me? Well, no, Rob. It stars a different Rob. But you said he has a double B in his name. I have a double B in my name. Well, no, you were named after this Rob. I thought I was named after King Robert. <sighs> Don't worry about it, Rob. So in this tale, Rob and Liana are telepathic investigators who have been called to the planet Shkia to look into a problem. On the planet, humans and the native population, the Shkeen, share the world. Shkeen are remarkably human-like, just shorter and hairless, but otherwise very similar. Their culture is 14,000 years old, but hasn't really advanced technologically. So right off the bat, we find that the Shkeen are similar to the Children of the Forest and Westerosi society, not to mention the Jane Shi from N7 Times Never Kill Man. That is, they are technologically stagnant, or at least technologically unambitious. So Rob and Liana first meet the administrator of the human colony, a man named Val Karengi, who Rob seems unusually hostile towards in his head. Val Karengi is a driven, confident, go-getter type of character, but Rob senses that he's emotionally distant. Rob and Liana then go to their room and proceed to get some sex on and sleep, and Liana wakes up with a headache. They then go to talk to Val Karengi about why they were brought to the planet. Val Karengi has some deep concerns about the religion of the Shkeen. The Shkeen religion is a bit odd, as that all Shkeen at age 40 become joined. That is, they place on their head a bit of slime they call the Grishka, and then at age 50, they enter some caves and proceed to give themselves to a huge mass of Grishka, where they are consumed by it. This is what they call final union, all Shkeen are part of the religion, and there are no heretics. Rob doesn't think that this religion sounds too different from Harangan cannibalism, whatever that is, but Val Karengi says that it's different because humans have been converting to the Shkeen religion. First a human telepath joined, and then the religion started growing. The previous planetary administrator even joined, and now the conversion rate is 1%. And this is why Val Karengi hired Rob and Liana. He wants to know why. And he figures telepathic investigators can get to the bottom of it. Val Karengi then takes Rob and Liana out for a night on the town with his girlfriend Lori. Lori is a redhead, our author's fetish. Rob senses that Lori is in love with Val Karengi, but Val Karengi is closed off to her in return. After dinner, drinking, and gambling, the crew goes to observe a Shkeen religious ceremony. There they observe Shkeen confessing to all of their past crimes and embarrassments. Infidelity, bestiality, impotence, you name it. The Shkeen there, though, are completely happy about joining the Union. A translation of the ceremony is given by Val Karengi and Lori, and there's a bit of back and forth here. And it's here where we get a notion of what the joining and the Grishka is. While Val Karengi thinks that people are dying and going to an afterlife to be with everyone else, Lori corrects him. She says that they aren't dying, they're becoming a hive mind. Everyone is themselves, but everyone is everyone else as well. They are not just being with each other, they are becoming each other together forever. Of course, we've seen the hive-minded blended consciousness idea countless times in our author's work. But notably, there is something slightly different about the Grishka versus, say, the Borg. 
This hive mind blended consciousness is a stand-in for heaven and the afterlife. This makes it very much like the Weirwood Net and the Undying of Karth. Now it is revealed that some Skeen do die before Union and they are mourned as they don't live forever in the Grishka. They simply die and are met with nothingness or oblivion. Anyway, the next day Rob and Liana wake up, Liana again has a headache, and they go into Skeen Town to find some Skeen who have joined. That is, those who have put the goo on their heads, but have not yet gone into the caves. Liana starts reading the locals, and finds that they're unlike Findy, Harangans, or Demouche. Their brains, she finds, are near identical to human beings. They do eventually find some joined Skeen, and are struck with their happiness, the Song of the Joined. Now we've run into the metaphor of a song being synonymous with collective consciousness before, in Guardians specifically, but collective consciousness is also the song, or the rag, in the Armageddon rag. And here we find out that the song in A Song for Leah is collective consciousness, and I very much believe that A Song of Ice and Fire is a collective consciousness of ice and fire. Now, Liana is a better and deeper telepath than Rob in our story, and so she is overwhelmed by it all. The openness, the sharing, the love. Interestingly, Rob and Liana find that there's no mental thought in the Grishka itself. It seems to just be the connection. So Rob and Liana return and talk to Val Karengi and tell him that the Shkeen are just like humans. Val Karengi, though, is unconvinced. He says that they are a more communal and sharing people, thus they seek more community with the Grishka. He mentions that the Grishka parasite is odd in that no other animals on the planet are susceptible, just Shkeen and humans. Anyway, Rob and Liana go to bed and have sex, and they talk about how their love is better than regular people's love because they really know each other being telepaths. It's a deeper love. In the morning, Liana has another headache, but the two go out to find some human joined. And so they set out and find two converts named Kamenz and Gustafsson. They are a happy pair, perfectly content after being joined. So Liana reads them. She learns their life story. Kamenz was a miserable, horrible, lonely man with no friends, but he kind of liked Gustafsson, so he converted when Gustafsson did. Gustafsson was the planetary administrator, but before that he saw his entire family die. The telepathic connection with Gustafsson and Kamenz is incredible for Liana. She says she now knows them better than Rob, and she's in love with them more than she is with Rob. Rob is mortified by this, so he and Liana try to open themselves up telepathically to each other more than they ever have. Rob and Liana experience a bit of a fever dream together, and in the end, Liana remembers a line from a poem called Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold, the line being, and we are here as on a darkling plain. This poem also makes an appearance in Dying of the Light, and it's rather clear that the Darklands of Duskendale are named after it. Anyway, the two fall asleep, and then Rob wakes up in the middle of the night and decides to go to the office where he finds Lori. She's upset because she senses that Val Karengi doesn't really love her and is closed off to her emotionally. She asks Rob what his telepathic read is, and he confirms her fears. The two talk about love, and Rob and Lori share a kiss. When Rob returns, Liana is gone, and he's worried, but Val Karengi convinces him to not waste a day, and the two of them go to the caves of the Grishka. There they find Shkeen in various forms, being consumed by the Grishka, but smiling. Rob reads the dying Shkeen and reads happiness. He then loses control and tries to walk into the Grishka himself. Val Karengi knocks him out and saves his life. While recovering, Liana visits Rob telepathically in his dreams. It turns out Liana joined the Grishka in final union. They again bring up the Dover Beach poem, as well as a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow about ships passing in the night, darkness again, and silence. Liana tells Rob that the Grishka is bliss, the body dies, but the soul is immortal in the union. She is together with others and in love with a billion billion people. She wants Rob to join her or else he will die and be part of eternal nothingness. The next day, Rob outbriefs with Val Karengi and tells him everything that happened. Rob believes that the Grishka is a god and offers a blissful afterlife rather than the dark emptiness of death, and that is essentially why people have chosen to join it. Val Karengi, though, is skeptical and thinks that the Grishka has a powerful psi lore that traps its prey. Rob disagrees and says that the joy of the Grishka is all the Shkeen need, which is why they haven't progressed technologically. Val Karengi, though, thinks that man's way of progress and striving is better. Rob then finds out that Val Karengi and Lori broke up, and Rob pities Val Karengi for being so emotionally closed off. Rob leaves Shkia hoping for something more than the god of the Grishka, but he understands the appeal in Liana's choice. Rob, though, has a bit of Val Karengi's personality in him. He fears the union a bit and hopes for something else. 
he meets Lori on his ship off world, and they have sex and ease each other's loneliness. So Rob, what are your thoughts on a song for Leah? I'm really confused. Did I have sex with my aunt? <sighs> You're useless, Rob. Useless. So I will say that in interviews and in his writing, our author repeatedly talks about what he believes writing is for, to capture the human heart in conflict. And a song for Leah attempts to tackle the conflict, what humans really want, on a fundamental level, deep down, what drives every single one of us. Now as part of the Thousand Worlds book club, we've read 24 stories. They've been about relationships, loneliness, religion, existentialism, technological progress, consciousness, and the self. And our author has half a hundred other stories not in the Thousand Worlds universe that also cover these topics. But I have to say, in a way, they all derive from the ideas laid out in this story. Essentially what I'm saying is everything, all of it, comes back to Leah. We can look at our author's view on loneliness and breakups that we saw in Meat House Man, This Tower of Ashes, and Dying of the Light. Leah came first. Or there's the ideas of blended consciousness and hive minds that we saw in Sand Kings and Seven Times Never Kill Man in Guardians. Leah came first. Or there's the look at death and existential crises in In the House of the Worm and Dying of the Light. Leah came first. Not to mention the function of religion in society, the importance of mortality and dying, ideas about colonialism, luring dreams. Yes, certain themes get more attention in some pieces, and in most pieces the ideas are separated out, but one could make a strong case that George R. Martin has been rewriting a song for Leah for 40 years. Which is kind of interesting, as not much actually happens in the story. They find a hive-minded race, Liana joins them, and Rob doesn't. The end. And it's also sort of interesting that A Song for Leah, the piece that combines most of George R. Martin's themes into a unitary story, comes so early in our author's career. He didn't combine disparate ideas together, but instead had his ideas break off from the central idea. And the central idea is rather clear. Our author thinks that the fundamental human conflict in life is between loneliness and collectiveness. And our author associates loneliness with death and darkness. The inverse is love, life, and light. Let's remember what religions usually offer people. Eternal life, seeing their loved ones again, collectiveness. Rob and our author see the appeal, but they choose the darkling plane. It's very important to note that our author is an atheist, an existentialist, and chose to have no children. This all gets explored in much more detail in In the House of the Worm and in Dying of the Light. It's no coincidence that In the House of the Worm is where we first hear the line, dark and filled with terrors, the antithesis of the life-obsessed religion of R'hllor. It's rather clear that dying scares the bejesus out of our author. And one chapter in Ice and Fire that really reflects it is Tyrion's experience at night on the Selesori Quran. Again, religion offers love, togetherness, eternal life, and happiness, but our author rejects it, much in the same way that Bran doesn't want to be part of the Werewood Net, and Davos doesn't want to give in to the Lord of Light, and Danny doesn't want to be part of the Undying. They're tempted, but in the end, they go their own way. Now, it's not too difficult to see the basis of the Ice and Fire universe here in A Song for Leah. The Grishka is like the Werewood Net, in that it's a tool to unite the Shkeen, just like the Werewood is a tool to unite the Children of the Forest. Joining the Grishka, just like the Werewood Net, involves going into a cave, and Rob even saw faces in the Grishka, just like those of the Werewood. And Leah, once in the Grishka, was able to send out luring dreams to Rob, just like Bloodraven is to Bran. And the Shkeen are like the Children of the Forest, where their religion centers around entering the Grishka, and they have no technological progress. And just like the religion of the Old Gods, the religion of the Shkeen later finds human converts, and just like with the Old Gods, outsiders view the religion as demanding sacrifices. It's really quite astounding how similar the setting is. And of course, we've seen a dream-sending, hive-minded stand-in for God before. Now I will say, when I first read the story, Liana's headaches and Val Karengi mentioning a Sylor at the end made me wonder about a sinister nature to the Grishka. And I'd also read Men of Greywater Station, Sand Kings, and then Seven Times Never Kill Man, where there was a sinister nature to dreams. When I met George R. R. Martin, I asked about the Grishka having a potential Sylor, that perhaps it had picked up this ability when it took in its first telepath. George said that that wouldn't be his interpretation of the story, but that he wrote the story 40 years ago and he can't remember it too well. So at the end of the day, it kind of sounds like Val Karangi was wrong. There was no sinister Sylor. Now there isn't too much more to say about A Song for Leah that we haven't talked about in our other videos. I'm still not understanding the situation. How could I have sex with my aunt when she died around the time I was born? 
It's all right, Rob, don't worry about it. We only have a couple more stories in the Thousand Worlds universe, and they're short. So next time we'll talk about Warship and the Runners. And I'll wrap everything up with a Thousand Worlds retrospective, where I'll talk about all of the stories and what they might mean for Ice and Fire. So we'll see you next time with Warship and the Runners. Thanks for watching.